What's up, TV Talk fans? Here with uh, something very, very special. Uh, obviously, you know that we are big fans of Troll Hunters. We had Dan and Kevin Hageman in here talking Troll Hunters, and now we have the man, the myth, the legend himself, Mark Guggenheim, in here talking Troll Hunters. Hey. Mark, thanks so much for having us. <laughs> thanks for having me. This is great. We, uh, we first of all, we loved, loved Troll Hunters. Oh, thank you. Amongst uh, a lot of your other work as well. Uh, we, you know, we we talked about it with Dan and Kevin that as soon as it popped on Netflix, we. Where, I mean, I binged that first season awesome. in no in no time. That's what we want. How did you? How did the project start with you? Um, so actually, about five years ago, I was working oh, wow. on the first season of Arrow, and originally, Troll Hunters was a feature film, um, mm. and they needed some help with the screenplay. And I came in and I did a draft, and I was about to start my second draft when, and this is the part that's still murky even to me. Mm. It was like they were like, "Go in this room, and there's a bunch of Netflix people in the room, and and." <laughs> Tell them what we're doing. And no one told me why, but I'm uh, just a good soldier. I just went off, okay, I'll pitch to whoever. Because there were a lot of like pitch meetings, like sure. various different departments in DreamWorks. So it wasn't completely uncommon, but I had no idea why I was doing it, mm -hmm. uh, except just to sort of show Netflix what we were up to. And next thing I knew, Netflix was like, we want to order this to the series. Um, and actually, it turned out to be the best thing that ever could have happened to us because one of the big challenges in working on the screenplay, and I think a big part of my job uh, as, as someone who was rewriting it, was taking the incredibly dense mythology that Guillermo had created and trying to cram it into like an hour and a half of feature mm -hmm. film was, it was next to impossible. Yeah. It was an incredibly daunting task. Okay. And the moment DreamWorks, no, the moment DreamWorks sold the series to Netflix, it was like this breath of fresh air where it's like, oh my God, we got room to move and we don't have to be constrained by, yeah. you know, an hour and a half. So it was terrific. Sure, sure. So I was gonna, like, so when you, I saw the writing credits, I saw you'd done some of the stories with Guillermo del Toro. Mm -hmm. So I assume because of your busy schedule, because I'm sure as some people know out there, you are show running Legends of Tomorrow and Arrow. Did it come to a point when it was announced that it was going to be a series of 26 episodes? You're like, I don't have time to write 26 episodes. It, I have two other shows I have to run right exactly. now. Exactly, and that's why we, we brought in uh, Kevin and Dan. And, and basically what we did was I, along with Guillermo, wrote the two-part the two part pilot mm -hmm. as well as a series Bible for the show. And then served as an executive producer, uh, you know, along with, you know, Rodrigo, blah and, and uh, you know, Guillermo and, and Kevin and Dan um, and just sort of contributed as we went, went along. And I got a chance to write a few episodes yeah. and rewrite others, and it was total fun. Uh, I want to know, what is the mind of Guillermo del Toro like? Oh, my gosh. You know, it, it's funny. It's incredibly sweet. Like, yeah. you would think, mm. like, it would be dark and <laughs> twisted. And, um, and every now and again, that comes out. Like, you know, the other day, he was saying, like, we were commenting on how old the, each of us are. And he was like, you know, we both have two pets left. Um, like he's measuring lifespan mm. in, in terms of pets. I'm like, okay, wow. that's that's a little dark. <laughs> wow. um, but but that what made that notable was it was so uh, you know just I guess out of character for him because mm. he's that's that's like the Guillermo I think everyone expects the one mm. you know talking about death and, mm. and darkness. But truth is like Guillermo's you know he's just a very l vibrant, lively, happy guy mm. who you know it's actually like you're like you look at him and you talk to him and you go. You're the one who came up with Pan's Labyrinth, really? Yeah, like, yeah, because yeah. I know somewhere there's a real sick mind going on, <laughs> but you're just so sweet. Yeah. Um, so it's great. And then Guillermo, you know, the other thing you notice about Guillermo very quickly is he has a million ideas. Like, mm -hmm. he, his brain is in constant motion, and he's just one of the most pure creative forces I've ever worked with. Mm -hmm. um, he's, you know, there's, I would say there's a reason he's Guillermo del Toro. It's, right. no. you know, it, 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 he's, it's totally genuine. Yeah. There's a thing I always find your story fascinating, Mark, because you went from you were a lawyer. Yeah. Because again, some of you may know you you've written a Civil War II books. Uh, uh, I did the Daredevil arc. Yep. Was actually a court. Uh, yes. Courtroom. So you used some of your knowledge there. Yep. Um, how did you come from lawyer to showrunner? Um, well, it was it was a little bit of a journey. Uh, the short version. I'll try to give you the really short <laughs> right. version. Um, is I was I was in my fifth year of practice uh, being a lawyer, and I had spent those five years. Um, since my third year of law school, writing on the side and like sort of honing my craft. Mm -hmm. And I was 29 years old. And, you know, when you're in the fifth year, it's like you got a fisher cut bait on the whole partnership track thing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, if I'm going to, if I'm going to do this, I was living in Boston at the time. If I'm going to do this, become a writer, I got to do it now. I got to do it, you know, before I'm 30 and I got to do it before I have mm -hmm. a wife, three kids and a mortgage. And <laughs> so mm -hmm. I, I quit my job and I moved out. 
um, to Los Angeles. I knew that I wanted to work in television, and I'd also uh, had a manager by that point. And I spent my first week or so uh, out here writing a spec sample. I wrote a spec West Wing, actually, during the first oh, season nice, of West Wing. Nice, yeah. And, um, y you know, uh, my manager, you know, said, uh, I, I think this is a good script. I think I can get you a job with this. Um, but I think an agent could get you a better job. Let's send mm -hmm. around to agencies. I'm like, oh, sure. I didn't know any better. Mm -hmm. um, and she sent around to several agents, one of which had just placed two clients on the show, The Practice. Nice. Um, and The Practice was the show that David Kelly was doing. It was going to be his fourth show. And he was, I think, about to launch his fifth, Boston Public. And I could have that math wrong. It might have been third show when he was launching for it. It's hard to keep track after yeah. three shows. Anyway, um, David was looking to hire first-year writers who used to be lawyers. Oh, so it wow. was like textbook definition of right place, wow. right time. Wow. Um, and as it so happened, I just spent five years practicing in the same jurisdiction where the practice in took Boston, place. So yeah, that didn't right. hurt. <laughs> um, I'm like, I know that courtroom. Yeah. Um, so uh, it, that, it was just pure luck, mm -hmm. uh, total good timing. And then just kept working and you know uh, went from the practice to law and order and then from law and order to jack and bobby that's where i met greg berlanti mm -hmm. um you know jack and bobby got canceled worked on csi miami worked on a show called injustice and then basically became a showrunner because greg uh, approached me about creating a show with him and that was eli stone and that was the first show i ran wow. so what is the difference i guess for when you're working on troll hunters it's animated and then you have you know legends of tomorrow and, and arrow what live action versus animation? Where does the brain go? Um, you know, I'll tell you. It's there's two different dimensions to it. Um, the writing brain pretty much goes the same place. Like I don't write Troll Hunters any different from mm -hmm. the way I write Legends, any different from the way I write Arrow. They're all tonally different, mm -hmm. um, and the voices of the shows are different. But like with respect to Troll Hunters, I'm not writing with kids in mind, and I'm not writing with animation in mind. Um, I'm just writing the way I write, and I'm writing appropriate for the project. Um, then you get into sort of the second dimension, which is the producing dimension, which yeah. is, you know, there are differences between animation and and live action. I would say they're both similar in the sense that in, in both cases, you have a line producer saying, this is unaffordable. <laughs> um, but what's different is in each medium, different things are unaffordable. Mm -hmm. um, locations are pretty expensive in live action. They're relatively uh, inexpensive in animation. Uh, the reverse, though, is true with extras. You can have, you know, if you can pay for it, you can have 100 extras in live action, really not a problem. Animation, it's really difficult that you start getting lectures about character density. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the reason is, is that those 100 people, you can have like run cycles and like little computer algorithms, but generally speaking, they've all got to be anima animated individually. Wow. Right. So that's why it turns out to be an expensive thing. And, and yeah. you know, there was an episode of Troll Hunters towards the end of season one uh, that I worked on where we had the spring fling dance. Yeah. And it was like, how are we going to do a dance? Because that's like <laughs> the hardest thing to do in animation to actually choreograph all these characters. And actually, if you go back and you look at that episode, um, you'll notice like you're seeing a couple people here, a couple mm. people here, a lot of it plays on Toby. Um, you know, and when I wrote that script, I specifically, I did something I never do, which is I called out the specific shots. Wow. Be like, we are gonna be here, and then we're gonna be here, and then we're gonna be here, all just so that we could actually pull off the dance. Wow. So it's just, you just have to think about different things. It's not, you know, it's not a complete shift to your brain, mm -hmm. it's just, you know, like, okay, this medium has these challenges, this medium has those challenges. Interesting. We all talk a lot about episode length. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot of debate we have on TV talk with the, with the fans and uh, with each other. It's like, you know, is it better to have 20, the kind of standard 22 episodes or maybe something more like, uh, you know, like an FX or something with like, you know, 10 to 13 episodes? 10 to 13. Yeah, so. <laughs> 10 to 13, okay, yes. Okay, so uh, that's, a good, that's a good question. No, because as a showrunner, as a showrunner of, yeah. of Arrow and uh, Legends of Tomorrow, w would it be easier for you to work in a 10 to 13 episode? Yes. Uh, okay, yes. that's oh God, all right. Totally that's, right. Totally right. Totally right. I mean, honestly, here's the thing. I mean, you take Arrow. Arrow's 23 episodes. Yeah. It basically takes us a year to do it. Yeah. Um, wow. I get two weeks off between seasons. <laughs> um, wow. Yeah, it's crazy. And I usually spend those two weeks writing a premiere. Wow. Um, so Legends does, we did, six, we did 16 last year, 17 this year. Mm -hmm. That's so much more civilized. And you're shooting yeah. a crossover event, too. And we do a crossover, which, like, and we do the crossover towards the beginning of the season, mm -hmm. and it's like, it's like uh, when you're running a marathon, but, like, the fifth mile is Everest. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like that. Um, but, it, you know, we, we do it for the love of the game, and it's fun. Um, but, yeah, I would I much prefer short seasons. Even, yeah. even Troll Hunters, if you go back and you rewatch those 26 episodes, we structured it 
uh, so that it had like uh, a, an organic act break in the middle. So it had, episode thirteen felt like a finale, like a exactly, season finale, exactly. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's, it, it was it was written to be that way, um, partially to leave ourselves open to the possibility mm -hmm. of maybe splitting up the season, but also narratively, like sort of like I always say, like. Um, if I was writing for cable, like let's say I was writing for HBO where right. they don't have act breaks, I would still write with act breaks in mind oh, because okay. I think it's nice to have certain narrative tent poles to build to. Mm -hmm. um, and we took that same approach with Troll Hunters where we're like, you know, we know we've got here would be the, you know, the quarter point, here would be the halfway mm -hmm. point, and we wanted to make sure that we were hitting certain emotional and plot tent poles yeah. as we were moving through. So yeah, 13 right. very much designed okay. to feel <laughs> like a finale, and 14's designed to feel like a premiere. Yeah. How do you feel about, uh, you know, the obviously the next Netflix model of the binge mm. and mm. where we're kind of going? I mean, obviously the crossover, we love the crossover this season. Thank you. The crossover with, you know, the Defenders, the Marvel Universe. Mm -hmm. Could we see like an extended crossover of like maybe in a binge format with Supergirl, with Ooh. Legends, with Arrow um, and Flash? I, I, you know, I always like to say I don't think that I'm spoiling anything. I don't even think I'm speaking out of school and like speaking for the network to say I'd be shocked and amazed if we didn't end up, end up doing a proper four part crossover okay. uh, oh. among all the shows. God help us. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you know, I, I, I think we all pretty much acknowledge that that's probably what's going to happen. <laughs> so we, um, I don't know if you can say if it's too early, but at the end of the, the first crossover we had with Supergirl, when she's leaving, you know, Cisco, Cisco gives her a device yes. so she can, you know, call for help or whatever. So can we assume that the next crossover will be on, on her side? Uh, you know, that's a good question. It's so early in our conversation. We have started having conversations mm -hmm. about the crossover, uh, but I wouldn't necessarily assume that. Okay. Um, just just because the stuff that we've been talking ab mm -hmm. about probably plays better on Earth One than on Earth mm -hmm. CBS. I guess a yeah. question, a kind of a two-part that has to go with Troll Hunters and yeah. with with Arrow. Um, with Arrow's like seasons one and two, you know, yeah. I mean, we just both just love those. I know in three and four, uh, there was some fan feedback uh, on some of the stories. I remember when f when five was having this season. I like your term, uh, feedback. <laughs> yeah, feedback. I remember uh, saying like, you know, I hear in Sierra Narcos, like Mark Guggenheim is coming in. He's a showrunner. Like your name was put front and center. So with Troll Hunters or Arrow, if you ever feel like you, I, I don't know how just creatively as a, as a writer hit a rough patch or hear a lot of fan feedback, do you take that in seriously? Or do you like, oh, oh they don't know what they're talking about. Like we know what we're doing, you know, as, as writers. You know, it's going to sound... Season, I was going to say, because season five just feels like it kind of got back to basics. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, we definitely got back to basics, and it was definitely an intentional sort of back to basics mm -hmm. kind of season. Not because people didn't like season three or like season four. One thing I've noticed with Arrow is, like, people tend to not like the season that preceded it. Mm, yeah. <laughs> um, or, you know, it's like, you know, everyone, you know, is sort of just always grousing on the, the most recent season. Um, you know, I think also one of the things that people have sort of started to see with Arrow is like, season three was really, really dark. So season four had to be lighter in response right. to it. And then once we sort of got the show back to a tonal place where it wasn't all doom and gloom all the time, then we were able to do what we're doing in season five, mm -hmm. which is be grim and gritty, like crime dark, but not emotionally dark with killing off characters left and right. Right. So it's, you know, it's always, each season has always been constructed in reaction to the season that came before it. Um, you know, that said, yeah, I, I hear all the time, yeah, seasons <laughs> one and two were great, seasons three and four are crap, seasons five is good again. <laughs> great, you know. Um, I, you know, and I think to, to, the answer to your question is it's really both. It's like, mm -hmm. yes, I, you know, no one, no writer likes to hear um, that people don't like, uh, you know, a season that you work so hard on. Um, at the same time, uh, there's times where I, I do disagree with the fandom. I actually really sure. like season four, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, oh. I'm, th that said, I've criticized, you know, the sh season. There's, certain, there's always things I wish we could have done differently mm -hmm. when you're doing 23 when, episodes. I was going to say, when you're doing 23 episodes, it's really tough. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, when you're talking about 10 episodes or even eight, you can, that's, that's just a mini movie. When you're dealing yeah. with 22, you're dealing with, you know, uh, you're dealing with Rockies one through five. It's, and you're doing it at this incredibly fast pace yeah. uh, to the point where it's kind of a miracle it's good at all. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think with season four, like, I'm definitely not a fan of how we dismounted off the Oliver Felicity relationship. Hmm. That felt very rushed. Um, you know, not a huge fan of the flashbacks. 
Um, they've always been really hard to write, and we sure. were really certainly struggling. Um, but this and season of flashbacks has been super it's like an, it's like a movie I want to watch in yeah. itself. Well, we're so filming good. right now episode seventeen, which is going to be our sort of all Russia episode. It's all set oh, in the past, nice. and it's like <laughs> Eastern Promises. It's yeah. so mm -hmm. much fun. The dailies are just starting to come in on that episode, and Incredible. it's. It's great. And Dolph Lundgren, you know, yeah. I can't say enough great <laughs> things. I mean, I remember, you know, there's like certain moments in my tenure with the show that are just incredibly special. Like, mm -hmm. you know, seeing Emily's audition for the first time or like watching the cut of episode 215, which was the uh, Take the Amazo episode. But uh, watching Dolph's first day of dailies, that is right <laughs> up there. It was like, oh my God, get his agent on the phone. <laughs> yeah. We need him for more episodes. Yeah. It was so great. And we are, I'm incredibly excited about where we're taking his character in particular. And uh, I think I think people will be intrigued. Fantastic. I think Dave and I both want to know, I guess the last question before yeah. we go to rapid fire yeah. is, if you could bring Batman to TV, what would it look like? Um, because Arrow well, is is our, is our Batman on yeah, TV. Yeah, well, I'm, honestly, you know, it's funny. Everyone's always like, Green Arrow, you're <clears throat> ripping off Batman. I'm like, have you read Green Arrow? Yeah, yeah. He's nothing but a Batman <laughs> ripoff. Yeah. Um, you know, all, all the time. In fact, my favorite thing was like, I think it was Kevin Smith who. You know, wrote the scene between Batman and Arrow and Green Arrow in the Arrow Cave, and mm -hmm. Batman's like, "Have you ever had an original thought?" <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, just totally leaning into uh, the the similarities. Uh, honestly, what I would like to do is uh, get really back to the idea of Batman being a detective. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that's something you've seen too much in the movies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we don't see it that much in the comic books anymore. But it, when I was growing up reading Batman comics, that was like, you know, my favorite aspect of the character yeah. was that he was like Sherlock Holmes. He's human. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and it's, you know, it's like, you know, yeah, he's got the cool gadgets and great, great at combat and everything. But what makes him, I think, really unique and interesting as a superhero is he's a superhero who can really, he could solve crime without the costume. Right. Yeah. Um, which is not to say if I were to do a Batman show, it would be costumeless. <laughs> I'd totally do the costume. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. one of the awesome parts of the character. But I think that that's an element of the character that uh, you know just hasn't been done, uh, certainly in live action. Awesome. Yeah. All right, let's, uh, let's, get, let's get into some fun questions. <laughs> okay. Some quick ones I'm ready. here. Okay. <clears throat> Who is the greatest TV therapist? This is a this is a troll hunters. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you this one. Real, uh, it's funny. I was gonna go with I, I was gonna go with J.K. Simmons' character from Law and Order. <laughs> yeah. I, was, I was gonna give you Dr. Fraser Crane. Oh, you're, yeah, you're oh, oh, I'm yeah. sorry. This is like I, I, you're asking my opinion, or are you asking? No, we're we're throwing this. You can do whatever. Okay. I'm this was because of Kelsey okay. Grammer. Those. Yeah, yeah, I, I, totally yeah. I totally got that. I totally got that. Okay. I respect so, that. <clears throat> fans want to know this. Sorry, one. Kelsey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Laurel or Oliver or Elicity. Oh, I can't answer that. <laughs> oh. I can't answer that. I've been oh. in so much trouble. There's, mm. there's no, there's, isn't there like a third option, like death by, uh, by firing squad? Oliver and uh, Ness Al Ghul. Um, still married under the laws of non <laughs> Uh Do you like social media? Oh gosh. You know, uh, great question. Um, <laughs> I have such a love hate, mostly hate relationship with it, but I do have a love hate. You know, it is. I, I struggle. The only thing I really struggle with is how rude people are. Mm. Uh, you want to express your opinion to me, that's totally fine. Like, everyone's entitled to their opinion. And I, I actually want to get feedback from the audience. But the, there's something about the anonymity of the internet that um, encourages people to be their worst selves. Mm. And, and look, I've been guilty of it myself, even though I'm not anonymous. Like, I've been guilty of, like, you know, responding in a way that I, I don't think was <laughs> as, you know, my best self. And in fact, my New Year's resolution was to the extent, my, my New Year's resolution was sort of twofold. One was to engage on so social media a lot less, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. when I do engage on it, to really take the high road. I mean, okay. we could actually do a reality show called Troll Hunters where we hunt these people down and, and confront them. <laughs> you know, not hunt them, not hunt them. You know what I mean. Oh, no, my, my, my joke was, you know, I, I think I was saying this in a couple of interviews, like, well, what attracted you to Troll Hunters? And I'd be like, I thought it was about something else. <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> so uh, are we ever going to see a Green Lantern on TV? Uh... I think I'm required by law never to talk about Green Lantern at all, <laughs> like ever. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, it's it's it, it's funny. It, it Green Lantern's so funny because it it has been treated uh, as like my mark of shame, but I, at the same time, I, you know, I, I always say I'm such a defender of that movie. You have no idea. I, I'll be honest. I am not. Okay. Um, <laughs> but I am. But I, oh. I am a big believer in the draft that we wrote. Okay. 
Uh, in fact, we wrote five drafts. I'm, I'm a believer in any Jeez, one of them. There you go. Uh, most of which do not bear much of a resemblance to uh, the finished movie. But, uh, you know, Google. Yeah. It's out there. There you go. Wow. Uh, how close are we to T-spheres on Arrow? Super close. Okay. Like, really close. Oh, Medina's going to be psyched. Well, yeah, I, I love the uh, Mr. Terrific's, uh, you know, yeah. transformation. He's great. Yeah, actually, um, you know, it, it's... Uh, it, first of all, I love Echo, mm -hmm. and I think he's terrific on screen. And, you know, you get a chance to start to... You know, actually, next... Uh, no, in, a, in two weeks, you'll get a chance to see a little bit for another step in that evolution. Nice. nice. Yeah. Uh, so if you could end Flash Forward your way, how would you have ended that show? Because I love that show. You know, I'll, I'll be totally honest with you. Um, David had a way to end it. He, he, we went in, there was a total plan. He knew mm. exactly, he knew what caused the Flash Forwards, um, how it was going to end. And I, it's not my place to pitch David's ending, but I will say it was great, okay. and it would have been awesome, and Man. it's just a shame Such that, a great show. that never happened. Thank you. So how uh, accurate is Stephen Amell with his bow and arrow? On a um, scale of 1 to 10. I watch his training on Instagram. He's always training hard. Yeah, I tell yeah. you, he, you know, here's the thing about, here's the thing about Stephen. He, there's, I haven't found anything physically that he can't do well. It's <laughs> yeah. actually very annoying. Yeah. Um, so it's like, throw a baseball? Yeah, fine. We can throw a baseball. Yeah. <laughs> And like hit a target and mm -hmm. hit, you know, throw for power. Um, you know, bow and arrow. He's he's very good at. We mm -hmm. very rarely shoot a live bow and arrow for safety reasons. Yeah. Um, gotcha. You know, there's as we like to say, you can fire a gun with blanks. There's no such thing as a blank arrow. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think the last time he shot an actual bow and arrow was season two when we were on the island, mm -hmm. and you could. You know, with with still a lot of caution and a lot of safety measures taken, mm -hmm. yeah. have him fire an arrow and have it fly through the forest. Good. Yeah. Um, but it's a little, you know, those things those things are sharp. I've yeah. got one in my office, and they they are sharp, and they're even when you blunt them, they are still dangerous as hell. Yeah. Wow. Uh, by looking at me and or David, could either one of us be in the Bratva? Hmm. You know what? Actually, uh, I'm gonna go with you, yes. David. I think your complexion's not right for the Bronx. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. You know, they're that's... not known for their racial equalities. This is you know. the story of my life. I know. <laughs> um, that said, that said, you're feeling a little too Jewish to be in the Bronx. <laughs> I don't know if you are Jewish. I'm not, but... Oh, well, there you go. But you could play one on TV. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Uh, okay, if you were a troll, what would your name be? Oh, um... I want honestly. I wanted my response to be like I was going to say like the username of one of the people who troll me on Twitter, <laughs> um, but I'm not going to do that. Gonna, Go ahead. I got my troll self into enough trouble as it is. Do people call you Googs? Is yes. that a nickname? Yes. All right, there we go. That's what I yes. thought. All right. Uh, finally, if you could put a CSI in a non-traditional city, where would you put it? Mm -hmm. Ooh, good question. In a non-traditional city. Because I, I know you worked on CSI in Miami. I did actually. Yeah. Uh, Hmm. So we've got CSI New York. Yeah, a non-traditional city. Miami. I would say, you know what? CSI Montauk. <laughs> I just I grew up on Long Island and The Affair. I, I love Montauk. The yeah. the affair? I guess that's yeah. true. Actually I don't, believe don't. it or not. I just yeah. I, I want to. Um I'm very interested in, in extramarital affairs. I've been married <laughs> for twelve years, so it's just I don't know why. I'm kind of drawn we'll cut to that, that subject part matter. Out for your wife. Um, oh, she's so used <laughs> to it. Are you kidding me? She lives with me. Does she, uh, if I remember this quickly, does she write for Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.? Uh, Agent, Carter. Agent, Carter, sorry, Agent Carter. Agent Carter, I'm sorry. Agent Carter. That was a great show. Yeah, I love Agent Carter. Thank you. Yeah, we've gone so far before its time. Yeah, um, yeah that's it was, a hard one. It was a good show. Fantastic um, show. Um, but uh, she and her writing partner, Michelle, they've, they've got a, a new pilot over at ABC. And, uh, oh, good. It's, I think it's the best thing they've ever written. So I I hope. Uh, I hope you guys get a chance mm -hmm. to see it. Well, you've given us some awesome uh, snippets here today, and uh, we can't thank you enough for being here with oh, us. Oh, no, thank you guys. We mm -hmm. really talk about your shows that. all the time, and uh, congratulations on Troll Hunter, Arrow mm -hmm. Legends, tomorrow. Uh, again, Collider TV Talk, we're here every Monday. I'm Josh McCuga. David Griffin. Mark Guggenheim. <laughs> see you guys. Cool. Thank you. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.